World War II combat veteran Paul Fussell's book, Doing Battle, didn't sell nearly as well as books by Stephen Ambrose, who somehow missed military service, but became wealthy writing about brave and brilliant American troops in World War II. Perhaps Fussell's work wasn't popular because he insisted on writing, quote, In the opinion of British military historian Max Hastings, the American forces were so bad, and actually so were most of the British, that when Allied troops met Germans on anything like equal terms, the Germans almost always prevailed. Thank God the troops, most of them, didn't know how bad we were. It's hard enough to be asked to die in the midst of heroes, but to die in the midst of stumble bums led by fools, intolerable. And I include myself in this indictment. End quote. American General Douglas MacArthur was the biggest fool during World War II. But General Mark Clark was nearly as bad. He was the son of a career Army officer and graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. As World War II allowed rapid promotions, officers with political skills moved ahead quickly. Mark Clark was a lieutenant colonel in 1941, and by 1942, he had jumped four grades to lieutenant general while serving as a staff officer who cultivated personal relationships with generals like his old friend, Dwight Eisenhower. General Clark did not lead forces in the North African campaign, yet Eisenhower selected him to command the American Fifth Army in Italy. His forces landed on mainland Italy and faced little opposition from the surrendering Italians. However, the Germans counterattacked his force at Salerno that almost collapsed due to a flawed plan that left his landing force divided by a river. See Professor Cody Carlson's review, link below. General Clark blamed his Sixth Corps commander and fired him. German forces poured into Italy and within a few weeks had established a series of fortified defensive lines in the mountains. Winston Churchill insisted that Allied troops make difficult attacks into these mountains up the boot of Italy. This was idiotic, as explained in the short video link below. Mark Clark was always eager to please and ordered his troops to conduct repeated dangerous attacks into these fortified German positions. To his credit, Clark often visited troops in the front lines to raise morale, but this was needed since soldiers were exhausted and demoralized by the senseless strategy. Our battle lines were haphazard as the terrain itself, with its flood-swollen rivers that twisted back and forth across our line of march so that each river seemed like five. And where there was no river to cross, a mountain blocked our going, each peak ahead being a few meters higher than the last we had won, so that each new peak had to be fought for, the hard, uphill way, with the enemy looking down our throats. They had had time to fortify and camouflage their positions. No amount of artillery fire or aerial bombardment could force them to withdraw. That was for the infantry to do employing those weapons that can find and destroy life in narrow trenches, caves, and fighting holes. It was up to the man with the rifle, the man under fire from all weapons, the man whose way all our weapons, land, air, and sea, serve only to prepare. It was up to the foot soldier to attack a hidden enemy over ground that was sown with mines. Meanwhile, on the olive terraces below, the second and third battalions had twice again attempted to reach their objective. Both times they had come up against a wall of automatic weapon, mortar, and artillery fire. Volunteer patrols made desperate attempts to reach enemy positions and reduce strong points. Not a single member of any such patrol ever came back alive. A great example of such fighting is shown in The Battle of San Pietro. This 32-minute documentary film was directed and narrated by U.S. Army Captain John Houston, 
about a 10-day battle in December 1943 in the rugged mountains 60 miles northwest of Naples. The film is linked below. Houston and his crew were attached to the U.S. Army's 143rd Infantry Regiment of the 36th Division. Houston's cameramen filmed alongside infantrymen as they fought their way up rocky hills. The film is known for its realism, with close-up views of faces of dead soldiers as they were being loaded into body bags, a level of realism unseen in fictional portrayals, as well as newsreel footage of the time. Army generals liked the film, but thought it would upset civilians, so the film was not released until the war ended in 1945. It was educational, so was shown to American troops as a training film. General Clark introduced the film to justify the heavy American casualties. In 1943, it was one of our strategic aims to draw as many German forces as possible away from the Russian front and French coastal areas and to contain them on the Italian peninsula while liberating as much of Italy as might be possible with the means at our disposal. As the bulk of our supplies was directed to England for the forthcoming invasion, operations in Italy had to be conducted on an extremely limited scale. Thus it came about that during the winter months, the number of Allied divisions in Italy was greatly reduced. Yet so determined was their effort that they succeeded in holding in Italy a very large number of German divisions during the pre-invasion period. San Pietro in the 5th Army sector was the key to the Leary Valley. We knew it and the enemy knew it. We had to take it even though the immediate cost would be high. The film admits that one-third of this infantry regiment was killed or injured to seize the town of San Pietro that was destroyed in the process. Such bloody battles occurred over a hundred times as American troops attacked up the rugged boot of Italy, taking twice the casualties of the outnumbered German defenders. General Clark stated these attacks were needed to pin down German divisions, but this could have occurred with static defensive lines kept active by artillery fire, airstrikes, and snipers. However, General Clark would not make news or please political leaders by standing firm to await the invasion of France. He ordered repeated bloody attacks against fortified German positions again and again and again. Another example of General Clark's incompetence occurred in January 1944, when the U.S. Army's 36th Infantry Division was ordered to cross the Gary River. The Americans call it the Rapido River because of its strong current. German forces were dug in high ground across the river. General Clark thought a bold night attack would surprise the Germans. American officers agreed they would be surprised, since the attack seemed suicidal. The effort was a disaster, especially after General Clark insisted it proceed after dawn, so more soldiers were slaughtered. After a day of bloodshed, a retreat was ordered after only 4,000 American soldiers had made it across the river. Less than half returned as the rest were killed, captured, or wounded. The Germans lost just 64 killed, with another 179 wounded. General Clark was in charge of the plan to outflank the Germans with an amphibious landing 60 miles past the fortified German lines at Anzio. The Germans were surprised, but cautious American generals advanced slowly despite a lack of German opposition. This allowed the Germans several days to move reserve forces into the hills overlooking Anzio, where they blasted American troops below. General Clark was the overall commander, but deflected criticism by blaming a commander who he fired. American troops finally broke out of Anzio and threatened to trap most of the German 10th Army. German General Kesselring ordered a retreat through the Leary Valley along Highway 6 via the town of Valmonitone. 
General Clark's nominal boss, British General Harold Alexander's plan was for the troops at Anzio to attack north and capture Valamanton to trap Kesselring's 10th Army. Unfortunately, General Clark was determined that his troops capture Rome and not the British 8th Army. This would make world news, and General Clark was excited at this opportunity for glory. He disobeyed orders and shifted his attack up Highway 7 to capture Rome. The irony was that by capturing Highway 6, it would have allowed the Americans to outflank German forces dug in along Highway 7 and allowed easier access to Rome. The Americans fought their way to Rome as the Germans declared it an open city and left. As Clark and his troops paraded triumphantly into Rome, the German 10th Army escaped past them to help form yet another strong defensive line north of Rome. The Allied 5th Army sweeps forward on the roads to Rome. In swift, staggering blows from both the casino and beachhead sectors, General Mark Clark's forces within less than four weeks have closed into the very outskirts of the Eternal City. General Clark enters Rome. Europe's first capital to fall to Allied armies of liberation is now officially occupied. The Roman populace begins to gather in a joyful reception. The Allies landed in France as Rome was captured and eventually swept to the German border. Further attacks in Italy were meaningless, yet General Clark insisted on continued bloody attacks into the Italian mountains for another year until the last day of the war. As a result, more American troops were killed liberating Italy than France and were never able to threaten Germany since the Alps are impassable. Most historians are critical of Mark Clark's dismal performance and rate him as one of the worst American generals in World War II. See the links below. General Clark was always eager to please and never argued with political leaders or more senior generals, so was never relieved after failures. As a result, Mark Clark was praised and promoted to four-star general by the end of the war. <laughs> 